Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. My name is John Cameron, and I'll be your moderator this evening. And as my uh, guests, I have Pamela Olson and Mike Giles. And uh, as you watch Libertarian Counterpoint uh, this evening and in the future, we're on Channel 17 in Sacramento on uh, Access Sacramento, uh, Thursday evening, 8 o'clock. We're also on at noon on Friday. And my favorite time, 4 a.m. on Saturday. Make sure you get up early for that show. And um, if you wait about three weeks after, after each air date, the shows are available on YouTube, which is, of course, the best way to watch because then you can stop it and make rude comments and, and go on and leave comments about how well we did. So um, what I'm going to do is, is uh, talk a little bit about uh, myself for about an hour and a half, no, for a minute, and then I'll turn it over to our guests. Um, right now, I'm a development officer for, for Pacific Legal Foundation, and uh, we sue governments and government agencies of all ilk. Uh, in the highest courts in the land to protect the Constitution of the United States. And I came to the Liberty Movement uh, quite early. I was an objectivist, originally read Dahl of Ayn Rand stuff uh, at age 15. And then when I went in the military, uh, I remember swearing an oath before I jumped out of airplanes and carried a machine gun. And it was uh, something like, I um, uh, swear to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And when I went into business for myself, I discovered that um, I was battling enemies domestic every single day, but they were politicians, unelected bureaucrats, and people who wear uh, black robes and sit on a dais in a courtroom. And these people, rather than protecting or defending the Constitution of the United States, uh, choose to avoid and amend it. And that's why I'm a libertarian. And Pamela Olson, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to the liberty movement? Absolutely. Thank you, John, for the opportunity to be here. I, uh, first and foremost, have to show off my new baby, uh -huh. uh, Save Our Children, uh -huh. which is a uh, organization that starts right here in Sacramento and is going after the abuses our children face on a daily basis from possible vaccine harm, because it's not settled science yet, it's far from settled, to child sex trafficking, which Sacramento is a hub, to um, anything and everything within the family court and juvenile dependency court that goes after our children and through them their families. Mm -hmm. I'm also a retired nurse mm -hmm. and uh, help my husband run his private business as well. Um, what brought me to the Liberty Movement? I was a GOPer straight out from 18 forward. Mm -hmm. um, Last year I went independent. I don't find that either party is serving me or my needs. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how I found Liberty. Well, welcome. Welcome to Liberty. And uh, Mike Giles? Yes. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to uh, Liberty Movement. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I joined the party of JFK many, many years ago. And uh, I kind of lollygagged around and worked in private industry and then I became a teacher and worked in education mm -hmm. and um, kind of just didn't think too deeply about it but slowly I began discovering all these bad actions, kind of what you were alluding to, uh, coming from the government bureaucracies, coming from our state legislature, lots of hidden little things behind the law and behind mm -hmm. closed doors. And so I um, jumped ship, so to speak, and talked to my old enemies, the Republicans, mm -hmm. and uh, kept on talking to more people. And then I discovered these libertarian characters, and they were really nice. Uh, Wait, you met a nice libertarian? Yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and, um, you have to introduce me to her. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. And um, so... It's really wonderful to find um, other people that aren't happy with either party mm. um, also. And I really appreciate hearing your um, recognition that you described about mm. um, various government bureaucracies um, imperiously pontificating away and mm. giving you things to do and you to, to pay for. Mm. Especially them. I hate paying for them. 
Yes. Well, welcome to both of you, and thank you very much for sharing a little bit about how you got here. So, uh, we have topics on the show, and we're going to start with Mike, and uh, this is kind of a, a double uh, topic, maybe even a triple one. So, does ancient climate science evidence qualify as settled science? Uh, let's start with that one. What do you think? Oh, okay. Well, um, I remember back in the 70s hearing about all this um, global cooling that was going to be going on and how everybody was going to be pretty much dead by the year of 2000 and everything. Believed that for a while, and then I didn't believe it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I heard this amazing long interview from this uh, woman who is a um, high altitude photo- photography specialist. And she described how 900 years ago, the Inca priest could walk up to the top of the Andes Mountains, drill holes in the stone, put their sacrificed um, perished babies Mm. in there, label them, and then walk on down. Mm. And now, when she's up there, they have to come in on a helicopter, because they visit that site plenty, and they walk to it, and she has 26 seconds to pull her glove off, take the pictures, and get her glove back on to avoid um, frostbite damaging her hand permanently. Um, So then I realized about the same time, the Norsemen were growing grapes in Greenland, which is now mostly frozen, or Mm -hmm. at least a lot of snow and ice. And so this climate thing has been moving around. (laughs) It's not, it's not something that there weren't very many Toyotas 900 years ago. No diesel I trucks. Think, I think Toyota is post World War II. I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure, which is not 900 <laughs> years ago. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, all those grapes that were grown in Greenland, mm-hmm. um, they're not there anymore because they're all frozen over. Mm-hmm. And so, the climate is got very little to do with what all these little creatures running around on the surface of the earth can do. Mm. Um, it's got more to do, in my personal personal opinion, with what the sun is doing. Mm. It's the powerhouse. It's it's the mm. powerhouse of the entire earth. So just, let, let's, th- thank you very, very much. So let's kind of take a poll here. So can we say that uh, geologic evidence and tree core evidence and sediment evidence and all the rest of that you know, because they talk about global warming being settled evidence. Can we take ancient climate evidence and say it's, we could call it science? Could we just say what's carved in stone, literally, in some places? Can we call that science, do you think? Well, as Joseph Stalin said, voting is great. What's the important is who's counting the votes. Uh, yeah. So um, repeatedly, scientists have been caught lying. Yeah, yeah. Outright lying or or lying by omission, yeah. adjusting. Oh, adjusting. That sounds like uh, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration adjusting the climate record. That's what that sounds like. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw in my two cents on this. I think uh, a lot of the historic evidence is, uh, well, depending on, again, who you ask. We can depend on it, you know, like we can depend on the, the gravity constant and some other things. We can depend on the speed of light. Mm-hmm. But when see people talk about settled science now, I think uh, what they're trying to do is is quash scientific investigation. And if if they still have arguments about uh, the law of gravity and Newtonian physics and Einstein's theorems about relativity and the theory of light, and if they're now uh, actually designing quantum computers to uh, to really act in ways that, that uh, Newtonian physics just finds baffling. I think we, we should all take uh, everything somebody says as settled with a grain of salt. That would be my, my thing. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, that, another question. And uh, I think I'm going to throw this open to whoever wants to jump in. Um, do 40% of Americans prefer socialism to capitalism and freedom? according to some of the polls that uh, you read. Uh, and are they all uh, Bernie Sanders or Venezuela fans, or do they, is there a disconnect? Mike, do you want to take that one still? Or Pamela, do you want to take it? Or I, you want I, me I to? want to take a swing at it, if you sure, don't mind. Sure, go, go, go ahead, go ahead. We want to hear. I know the old saying, most people 
mm-hmm. growing up. Believe mm-hmm. that everyone thinks as they do. Mm-hmm. It's when we grow up, mm-hmm. hopefully post-college, mm-hmm. that we realize that is not the case. Mm-hmm. In this case, polls have come under such striking and hard and stark realities of being absolutely incorrect mm-hmm. um, from the temperature of the nation mm-hmm. and what they want and don't want uh, that brings us now to this very divisive time where you now have uh, not so much two clear sides, but definitely sides. We're almost like an octagonal nation at this point, not a two-party nation or a two-sided nation as it has been so clear in history in the past. Um, I wouldn't put a percentage behind anything unless you were speaking to a specific quantifiable group. Now, if you're talking about a specific group, people who identify as capitalist or socialist, and then you take a poll of them, which one works best for you, then I might actually believe that 40% would prefer their particular flavor of socialism, which there are many now running rampant in in California as well as the nation. Um, And capitalism now has a very distinctive meaning that's different from what I remember capitalism being taught in college and in high school. Mm. So you end up going from the macro Mm. into a micro, and in the micro you might be able to find your 40%, and that's about as far as I'd be willing to back that up. Mm. So I think, uh, do do people see, let's take the question a little bit further. Um, Do people see that that, uh, their preference for for socialism is Bernie Sanders or Venezuela? And, And I think what happens is that it's, the, it's that, that uh, ideologue part of the American nation that gets us into trouble. They say, well, socialism would, uh, would work if only. Socialism would work if only. And unfortunately, uh, if only is a little bit uh, further away than Neverland. Um, so if only doesn't exist. That's, that's my take on it. And I think we can move on. Um, I think anybody who who's, has an open mind to history will see that whether it's national, sociali- national socialism or socialism or communism, whenever the, the system has been in place long enough, which is until they you know, burn through all the goods and services produced by capitalists, they fall apart. So I think we can all agree on that. Let's talk about something, and I'll take the lead on this. Do our government monopoly schools account for a deficit in human values and economic knowledge, and how may we do better? And I would say uh, an unqualified yes to um, blaming uh, government monopoly schools for the um, at least part of the deficit in human values that we see amongst children, and certainly a deficit in economic knowledge. And I would say, I would take it a step even further, that it's an intentional dumbing down of the voting populace at an early age um, so that they can be easily manipulated. And uh, that would be my theory. Now, there are, there are good people who are teachers. You were a teacher, and I'm sure you didn't walk into the classroom every day wanting to do a bad job. And I will say this, that in every organization anywhere, whether it's military, private sector, public school, hospital, if people are held unaccountable for the quality of the product product they produce, Mm -hmm. then the quality of that product, whether it is a healthy patient leaving the hospital, if you as a nurse were held unaccountable for the health of your patients, what would happen? Or it's a productive, educated student leaving your door so that they can add to the tax base rather than take from it, that you're going to have problems. So whenever you have a government monopoly, you have, at least in any government I'm aware of, especially in ours, a lack of accountability. And that would be um, my take on that. And I will go again and say, how may we do better? I would say the way we do better in every other part of our life, in entertainment, in, a, in uh, agriculture, in the manufacture of goods and services, in technology, and that's what? Competition? Capitalism, a free market. What do you guys think, Mike? Um, Since you're in education, why don't you why don't you throw I'll, in on I'll, it? I'll throw my two cents in, so yeah. to speak. Um, I, I agree. I, I work with some really fantastic teachers, some fantastic principals, school secretaries, 
custodians, food service people, bus drivers, they're all part of a complete system and they're all shortchanged by that system and they're all having to work a little extra hard just to kind of bring the, bring the thing up. Um, and the teachers that don't do that, it goes down real fast. Um, <clears throat> two things real quick. I remember reading um, letters written by Civil War soldiers, eighth grade graduates. And they were so graciously and delicately written, had such um, insight and such poetry built into the language that college graduates these days would have one heck of a time equaling that. Mm -hmm. So like you say, government schools. In those days, the schools were community schools. Mm -hmm. The teachers lived either in the church or with different parents. And nobody got much money, mm -hmm. but the learning was very high. Mm -hmm. And um, stuff I, I've seen curriculum from the 1870s is beyond what we could do now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so um, there's really great teachers out there. Um, but part of the problem is the decay of the society itself with less interested parents and mm -hmm. things like that create a problem. But um, there's really wonderful kids these days. Mm -hmm. there's, there's great kids out oh, there. Yeah. They get a bad rap, but there's I, I not only just the kids in school, but the millennials who get a terrible rap. Yeah. They might have a degree in biology and have to work at a coffee house and in retail and in some kind of food service just to make ends meet because they can't get a job. They're willing to work, and they know that uh, the system's broken. That's kind of an aside. Back to Pamela, did you want to throw in anything on the government monopoly in education? Believe it or not, John, my eldest daughter is a uh, teacher, a fantastic teacher. Mm -hmm. She graduated and had to work two jobs as a wait staff and another part-time job waiting for a position to open up because the teachers union, um, whether those out there are aware or not, really do hold an iron grip in California yep, over right. our teachers, new teachers that are ready with new technology. Um, where she found home, believe it or not, was not in your traditional schooling. She has a charter school that she teaches at, and she loves it. It's the same great structure that every child needs for education. Um, some of these children are half homeschooled mm -hmm. and then come in three days a week for mm -hmm. socialization and in classroom. She has found it to be such an enriching experience that she doesn't understand why anyone would go back to what we now consider the norm within K through 12. Mm -hmm. And really, our government looks at it K through 14 mm -hmm. because that's where they get funding all the way through junior college. So when you look at what works versus what we're paying for, mm -hmm. it's very obvious where the money is going for what doesn't work instead of those who are finding ways to make things work outside of the norm, and these children are really succeeding. Special wow. needs, your That's normal, really good and your exceptional children. Hmm. That's wonderful. Cool. Uh, I'll throw in one more thing. There's <laughs> just, uh, it's just a phrase, there's a lot of money in failure. Oh yeah? yeah? I was yelled at by a really great teacher when I was younger and just getting into it. He said, don't say the things you're saying. You're gonna make enemies of all the different uh, factions. We need to fail so we can ask this, the um, population for more money. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the and government so, can't fix a problem unless it creates one. And, yes. And uh, without a problem to fix, you get no money. So let's move on to uh, something that's near and dear to me and to Pamela. Do family law court, juvenile dependency court, and CPS systems help? or hinder our values and culture, Pamela. Okay, so I don't know how many of you follow the narrow topic of the California Judicial Process Board. This is a board that Reagan gave a 10-year extension to basically wipe the books clean because they hadn't audited themselves mm -hmm. at that point for almost 20 years. We're now 60 years from Reagan, from his governorship here in California. Yes, California, as usual, burst the great idea that carried the great ideals of conservatism in a moderate way. I think Californians are, uh, I don't think it's fair to call us moderates. I like to think we're purple. Okay. We, we are the purple people. We're not red, we're not blue, we are purple. Um, as it comes to this board, 
any board that is allowed to run amok, any entity for that fact, that is allowed to run amok with power, unchecked, and has immunity, is going to be corrupt. What is the old saying? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's right. This is now what has happened within our judiciary and has now trickled down through. Uh, most people don't understand the difference between family court, juvenile dependency court, uh, juveniles who are in trouble as teenagers being caught on a crime. These are three different courts. CPS runs absolutely with immunity. They're they're allowed to lie to parents. They're allowed to make up allegations. They are allowed to do all sorts of things that the public has no idea is going on. And it's a very frustrating process for parents because no one wants to hear it. That must, you're not telling me the whole story. Then we have the family court system that was set up, as you well know, by Mondale in 74 and restructured under Bill Clinton. I'm, I'm sorry, 74. Bill Clinton in 97 um, gave it even more power to say, even though you're a functional family and you want divorce, I think you all need counseling for at least the next 30 years, <laughs> right? So from picking our pockets to picking our minds to picking now out our souls, they are now looking at a populace that is nothing more than a carcass, and now they're wanting the bone marrow to make their bread. It that's, has to stop. That's, that's, a, ugh, that's kind of an icky visualization <laughs> you did yes, there. I'm, um, I've, I've heard horror stories. I, again, you know, Mike, I'll talk to you a little bit, because I know people in CPS really care, and I know people who've had to get out of CPS because they really care. Um, same thing in family court law and juvenile dependency court law. And I, th I think, you know, again, anytime people, uh, like pa Pamela, you mentioned, anytime people can act with impunity and there is no audit process and there is no accountability over and over again, you know, if we're, if we're poor parents, we produce a bad product in a child. If we work and we're in the private sector and refuse to show up and do our job, we get fired. But in, in um, government, uh, especially independent government regulatory agencies and, and uh, court systems that have a tremendous amount of autonomy and power, they run amok. So I think we're all pretty convinced that that's a problem. <laughs> and now, uh, one of my favorite topics that we like to talk about on the show, um, tangentially and straight on, and that's... What have we learned from alcohol prohibition? Is the current war on drugs a repetition and expansion of its dire effects? Mike, you want to throw down on that one? Well, I, I can offer my what I've learned and what I've seen mm -hmm. a, a little bit. Um, I remember working at a, a rough and tough school, and um, even some of the greatest kids eventually got pulled down into the drug world, which means living on the street, sleeping in alleys, or messing with some really bad people, mm -hmm. getting beat up by them, being robbed by them, mm -hmm. and some few of them dying mm -hmm. or being killed mm -hmm. um, out there. So that's deeply, deeply disturbing to me. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I just read something fairly recently that regarding um, prohibition, it did actually bring um, alcoholism down and reduce the amount of volume of alcohol that the mm -hmm. public was consuming, not in places like Chicago where mm -hmm. you have these criminal gangs mm -hmm. that were killing anybody that got in their way. Um, so I mean the city of Chicago was kind of, I'm kind of guessing, um, kind of co-conspirators with these gangs because mm -hmm. they they traded money back and forth, I'm pretty sure, you know, Al Capone and all that mm -hmm. in Chicago. But um, so it, I, I think the record is mixed. It's not easy to say, yeah, let's just go do it because mm -hmm. Colorado's getting a lot more um, traffic accidents and deaths from people smoking marijuana and driving. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'd say it's a mixed bag. It's not, you can't bring your prejudgment to it. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on the other side of that. As you know, we're two libertarians never agree on anything. <laughs> so um, I'm, not, I'm not aware of the numbers on, on um, car wrecks and, uh, and um, all the rest of that from, from pot in Colorado. But I, um, I'm, I am aware that um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm a numbers guy. I like to use, I like to tell stories, but every once in a while you've got to throw out a number. And, and uh, somebody, 
uh, conservatively um, said that the worldwide profit in drug trafficking was about $50 billion a year. Um, I think that's, I mean, it's probably double that. Let, let's call it $50 billion a year. If, if the drug lords have been washing, cleaning, laundering $50 billion worth of cash for the last 20 years, and they've been doing it for even longer, then that's a trillion dollars that somehow ended up uh, cleaned up and owning things in the real economy. So um, trillion dollars is the, uh, the little bit more than the market value of Apple. Um, so even if they bought shares on the open market, what I'm saying is that there is, there is so much money being made from illegal drugs that it corrupts everything in its path. It corrupts the courts, it corrupts the, the, unfortunately, the people who make a living as correctional officers because without um, people who abuse drugs, there'd be nobody in prisons. It employs tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of attorneys. It keeps 70% mm -hmm. of cops employed and all the rest of that. So I think I might come down on the other side of it. It's horrible to watch a, a young child overdose and die in an alley. I think it's even more horrible to watch um, a thousand children prostitute themselves to buy a drug that should be free. Um, so I'll look at it like that. Oh, okay. And I think um, I think that again there are there are no perfect solutions to anything. Um, but you know one of the things that we like to do here on Libertarian Counterpoint is have some discussions about some alternate solutions to the uh, government-sponsored things that seem to cost us. Um, an awful lot more money every year and deliver an awful lot less result. So if you manage to channel surf, which amazingly people still do, and you arrived at Libertarian Counterpoint this evening, folks out there, what I'd like you to do is uh, maybe uh, set your DVR to record us in the future so that you'll hear a little bit of an alternative to um, what you think of as uh, the traditional way to manage things. And I want to say, again, I am John Cameron, um, your moderator this evening. I've done a lot of these shows, and they're all quite enjoyable. So I want to say thank you very much to Mike Giles for bringing your um, tremendous experience uh, in life and in teaching. Pamela, your nonprofit and your medical background and your open mind and your newly arrived Liberty Movement. You've been delightful guests. I want to thank you very much for your contribution this evening and ask you to have a wonderful evening. And to our audience, I want to say thank you very much for watching Libertarian Counterpoint. Take care and have a good evening.